Well, hello, minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. So I'm getting ready to teach a new class uh, starting this week in core techniques and watercolor. And a big one of those is blending and water control. So what I thought I'd do today, uh, since I'm thinking in those terms, and it's been a long time since I've really done a video on water control, is I would show you a fun way to practice and just uh, show you some of the things to practice. All kinds of ways you can practice, of course. You can just practice on wide open paper with nothing. And that's fine. I've done that a lot of times. You can draw your own shapes, squares, circles, whatever. Another way I use is I do zentangles. If you don't know what a zentangle is, go look it up. It's a quick way to divide uh, an area into spaces. But a really fun way is coloring books. You know, for a while, uh, a couple of years ago, this was a huge trend. I think that trend has sort of waned or fallen off. But there are still a lot of coloring books out there. I bought some just to try them with uh, watercolor. I don't really color a lot, um, but it's a lot of fun. But there are images in here that would make for great practices. What I want to do is show you how I would use an image out of a coloring book to practice with. And I am thinking in terms of blending and water control practice. So, I mean, if you want to color, you just want to color, that's fine. But if you're a beginner and you're trying to learn watercolor control, and the biggest aspect of watercolor control is pigment to water ratio. That's a huge area to get right for beginners, and it's a struggle at first. It's something you have to do repeatedly till you get a feel for it. And something like images like this can be a fun way to do it. So I'm in Johanna Basford's Enchanted Forest coloring book. I love her coloring books. I love her art. Uh, I decided I wanted to, to work on this owl. I like the shapes. It's going to make for some good practice. And I'll show you uh, several things that you can practice to help you get better at controlling water and pigment ratio. Now the first, now the trick is getting this image onto high quality watercolor paper. This is 100% cotton paper. This is actually Canson Heritage. But of course, arches would work great. So the first challenge is getting this image on here. And I only want a portion of it. I think I just want the owl and a little bit of some of these branches. So I made a copy. Uh, if you try to do this on a light table, you got a competing image on the other side. So it's not going to work. You need to get it on a copy. So if you don't have a copier, you know, just go down to your FedEx office or your UPS store. Or some office supply stores usually have copiers. And I also blew this up a little bit because I wanted the owl to be bigger. If you're thinking in terms of just practice, you want to give yourself a variety of size shapes. You don't want them all to be little because practicing in larger areas is very beneficial too. So I've got this copy and it's on fairly flimsy copy paper. Really the flimsier the better. You're not painting on this. You're going to get this image onto here. There's two basic ways to do that. Now first of all, Let's talk about printing the image on here. There, you can, if I wanted to, I could run this through my inkjet printer. Uh, the problem with inkjet is almost all inkjets run with water, so it's not a really good option. If you have, uh, let's say, a laser color laser printer, I think that uses a wax-based toner. That might be an option. You can just scan this image and print it right out on a color laser, or you could go someplace that has color laser printers and would be willing to, to run this thick paper through their laser printer. But I'm going to just talk today about the basic way of just transferring the image to your paper. And there's two ways to do that. The light table is one, which is what I'm going to use. I just have this little uh, Hui on light pad. I did a review on this. They may have an updated version. And with my overhead lights on, it's probably a little hard to see. But that's what I'm going to do. But let's just talk for a minute about if you don't have a light pad or a light table. You can use a window, by the way, like a patio door window. A lot of people do that. You just tape this up to your window, tape this over it. Another way is transfer paper, uh, graphite paper in particular. This is really, really old. You want to make sure you use wax-free graphite paper. There's also transfer paper that's permanent. It's like a wax-based and it won't erase. I like uh, using the graphite paper because it erases easily. And it looks something like this. And you can use pieces of this over and over and over again. So it's actually really efficient. And I'm not going to do this this way, but it's very simple. Basically, just take your watercolor paper, take the image that you're transferring. Uh, I would just have some white artist tape. You can use uh, drafting tape, something that doesn't not stick 
terribly and just hinge it at the top don't take it all the way around just at the top you want to be able to lift and see what you transfer I'll just do a little little bitty piece of this then you just get a pencil or a ballpoint pen I usually like to use a color so I know where I've drawn press firmly but not like super super hard and there you have a nice transfer and it, it usually works really well again you want this copy paper to be fairly thin if it's graphite transfer paper uh, it erases very easily as you can see there so that's that method it's an inexpensive method you don't have to buy a light pad if you are interested in buying a light pad I will link to both my review of this one and to an Amazon link down below these are really fairly inexpensive nice and thin just work off in a USB power cord but the, the graphite paper transfer method works fine I uh, for years as an illustrator I used it and uh, it's great for transferring to opaque surfaces that you can't put over a light table too but with that said I prefer the light pad method myself mainly because I can get a more controlled and crisper line now when using a light pad to transfer you do the opposite you tape your uh, image down to the light pad alright I've turned off my overhead light and then I'm just going to tape center this image under my uh, watercolor paper by moving the watercolor paper around and I'm going to do the same thing I'm just going to tape it down to the light pad. The advantage to using a light pad versus transfer paper is that you can use whatever you want to copy the image down. You can go right to ink and do a, a final ink or you can do pencil. I actually am going to go ahead and use pencil anyway because I don't want a line but if you want that dark line uh, you can go right to ink this way and you just trace. You have a little more control over the line this way too. You know, transfer paper, graphite transfer paper has its uses, especially on thicker material that's opaque. But if at all possible, I always like to try to do this. It doesn't take very long. And it could be if you're going to do a lot of practice or coloring, you might want to just have a transfer session where you would do several pages of these and set them aside. But these are wonderful ready-made images. You don't have to worry to, about sitting down and drawing something out in advance. Or uh, you don't have to be bored by just uh, drawing circles and squares and practicing in those. Although there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, you can only do so much practice on circles and squares and stuff like that without <laughs> getting bored and saying, oh, I wish I had something more interesting to practice on. And you can omit lines if you want to. You know, you can say, like on this eyeball here, if you don't want all these little bitty sections or lines in there, I'm not going to put that in. I can do that with paint if I wanted to. So let me get the rest of it transferred that I want to paint and show you some of the things you can practice using coloring book images. Alright, so I've got my piece all transferred. You can see here I just did it with pencil and that's going to be fine for me. I only included a few of these leaves. Uh, I think mainly this will give me enough to practice and to show you what I'm after. Now when you pick these coloring book images, uh, as I mentioned before, do think in terms of practice. Do think in terms of what kind of practice you need. Uh, give yourself a variety of shapes and sizes. And even leave out details if you want to. And as you start to work on these, and I'll make more uh, points about this as we go, be mindful. Be mindful of what you're doing. As you start to fill, start out by telling yourself what it is you're trying to accomplish. Usually if you're starting cold, I usually uh, recommend you start with a flat wash. You progress to blends, you know, blending from a color to no color. Doing value scales, like a series of leaves here is a great uh, way, area to do value scales. Here's another one where you have all these shapes in a row. This could be your lightest value and it could graduate to darker values as you get out here. But I guess what I'm getting at is pick an area, decide what it is you're practicing, and be specific with yourself. Say, I'm going to practice in this area blends. Blending from a color to no color. Or blending from a color to very little color. Uh, in this area, you know, say I'm going to practice wet and wet charging. Uh, whatever it is you're practicing. 
And I'm going to demonstrate a few of these and give you some ideas about uh, what you can practice and how you can move along. Alright, I'm going to start coloring this. And it's important uh, to have plenty of blotting material because one of the things for beginners is controlling the water pigment ratio. And you will be changing this water pigment ratio constantly. So I usually have a rag in my left hand. I usually have a, a rag over here for wiping. You'll, ch you'll wipe out moisture by just running it along a ridge like this. Add moisture uh, by either immersing the brush or just dipping the tip. I mean, there are just infinite amounts and ways of changing the water ratio. And after a while, it just becomes a feeling. It just becomes something that you know how to do and you can kind of get a feel for on your palette when your ratio is right. So as I mentioned I like to start with flat washes. A flat wash is just an even wash. No gradations. And I again want to stress be mindful when you're practicing. I need to put my right hand over here but I wanted you to also be able to see my palette. What I like to do, my per particular goal is a perfect flat wash. A perfect flat wash just means perfectly even, almost like it was spray painted. So choose some areas that you can do flat wash on and be mindful of what you're doing. Don't paint mindlessly. Be mindful of how much water and pigment is in your brush. Start with relatively small areas. I'm going to start with the center of this beak here. It's pretty dark. I have a lot of moisture so I'm going to just blot that just slightly. If you can see a little bit of a bead that's okay, but if you see, if it's coming out a whole puddle, you probably have too much. Once you get some moisture on the paper, spread it around. If you finish filling the shape and you still see a puddle, take moisture out. Either blot it or pat it into the rag in your hand and pick up. Pick up until you don't see a puddle anymore. You see just a nice even pool of color. And if you've decided that that's too dark, and it will dry lighter by the way, but if you decided that's too dark, you can even uh, squeeze out your brush. This is one of the ways of adjusting value. And just brush over it lightly to pick up some of it. Now these are practice exercises, so I want to stress that it does, it's not important how you want to paint, or what kind of style. You want to be a loose washy painter where you splash around a lot of paint, that's fine. I still would practice this way because in my opinion you have to gain control to lose control. Gaining control of your paint and your water um, ratio is so so critical. By the way this is uh, Renaissance paint and I have pre-wet uh, all of these uh, paint pans, half pans. Renaissance is a honey base, so it's very similar to M. Graham. It re-wets really easily. But you want to have uh, paint that's fairly easy to wet. So I'm going to get out some blue and some Payne's Gray. Put a little red ochre in there. I want a good dark. So I'm going to do a flat wash on the eyes. And I have the sense that there's a little too much water in my brush. And you can pat up near the ferrule. Just get the edge on your rag. Uh, we'll take some of it out. Brush size is important. That's too much water, I can tell. I've got a, a puddle here. I want enough to move and spread over that area, but I don't want a puddle. So once I put it down, I can blot out more of the color and then just move it. A common, 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 common mistake with beginners is too much water. I mean, you can get too little water too, but uh, the biggest mistake I see is too much water and not enough paint. Um, for some reason, beginners, a lot of beginners I encounter just seem to be too afraid to get some paint out on their palette. In this case, you've got to because it's uh, dark. Now, I'm going to swish my brush in the water a little bit, take out some of the pigment, squeeze it dry. I'm just going to brush over this because I'm still seeing a puddle. And... A puddle will dry unevenly. So if your goal is this beautiful, perfect flat wash that looks almost like it's airbrushed, just slightly pick up some of that puddle. That will also keep the pigment from pushing out to the edge and creating a hard edge. Hard edges are just part of life in the watercolor world, but you can minimize them. 
Now I have a dryer brush. I can tell I have a dryer brush by rubbing it on the palette. And I probably won't have to pick up a puddle of paint on this. I just left a glint inside the eye. But, but I am going for a perfect flat wash. Brush size is important. You want one that carries enough moisture but has a point to fill the, the crevices and corners that you're painting. So mindful, mindful practice. Telling yourself what your goal is in doing this wash right here as you're putting it down. You're not just mindlessly coloring. Mindlessly coloring is fine if you're into coloring books and that's a, that's a different activity. You know, so when I say mindful practice, you know, again, I'm telling you to set a goal for each shape that you fill and what specifically you're trying to practice. Put on some music, you know, something like that, but don't go into a mindless state of coloring if your goal is to practice. Sorry to be repetitive, but I just want to make that clear. Okay, so another flat wash I want to do are these eyes, the yellow part of the eyes. Okay, again, I've got a little bit too much water. It's okay to put down a good bit to start, but then usually you want to be able to move it around. Uh, I keep coming over here and blotting out near the ferrule. And all of the exercises I'm going to show you today are basic ones. They're ones that you will use in paintings over and over and over again in various ways. So you want to become so adept at them that you can do them without thinking. And then it does kind of become mindless. But uh, I recommend these, these exercises even for uh, intermediate and advanced painters. Just to kind of, uh, for a moment, take your technique process back to square one. I did this several years ago, well maybe 15 years ago, and I had been painting, I've been watercolor painting for 40 years, but about 15 years ago I guess, maybe even 20, I decided I'm going to take all of my process back to zero and pretend that I'm a beginner again and just be mindful of, of the way I do everything and challenge the way I did everything. And there were definitely tweaks. And so when you when you do mindful practice, you're thinking about how you put down the paint. You're thinking about how much water is in your brush. You're thinking about ways to remove water, add water, uh, make the pigment more concentrated, less concentrated. You're thinking about all of those. And as you do more and more and more of that, you can then do them. It becomes easy to do them. Uh, second nature, you know, we won't even think about it. And you'll have a sense for what's in this brush. I get asked all the time to to how much water, you know, what's the amount, there's no fixed amount of water. I, I can't say you use this much water and this much paint. That's just impossible. It's it's infinitesimal in its ratios and the way the, the ratios change. Okay, so I'm gonna let those dry. The next thing that I recommend that you try practicing with uh, images like this is value scale. And look for a sequence of shapes where you can change the value in steps. Uh, these shapes here along the lower breast are a good example. For instance, I would probably make this one in the center a certain value, probably light, and then graduate each shape to slightly darker. In addition to doing a perfect flat wash without thinking, you want to be able to call up a value lighter or darker on any color at any given time. There are, is adjustments and it it's not something you have to do perfect on the first application but there there are ways while it's still wet that you can alter it. But let's start uh, with these shapes here and um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. I mean the, really if you've never done a value scale you should just practice with small squares. But once you're feeling kind of adept at that um, try to tackle something like this. So we're going to paint a shape here and I'm adding water because I want it lighter than, than that. So I put down a particular color and value. I added water to make it lighter. I'm blotting water out because I've got the, the right dilution that I want. Now I'm going for a perfect flat wash. I'm going to keep blotting till I've got 
a wash here that's even and not puddled. And there it is. And that will dry so that it looks almost like an airbrush. Now I'm going to go for a slightly darker value on this side. A little too much water. I don't want to end up with any puddling. And by the way, if you're not doing this with cotton paper, you're going to be more frustrated. And I'm just blotting my brush till it's dry enough to lift paint. That'll dry a little bit lighter. Now without going to any water, uh, with a dryer brush sometimes it's useful to just pick up pigment because off of the palette because it's going to be more uh, concentrated. And yeah, there you go. So I have a darker color. Don't get frustrated if you don't, you can't call up these values like immediately. It does take practice and it does take time. But it's such an important skill to develop. Alright, so I've got about the right value but I've got too much water on there. And you always have the fail safe of coming back later with a glaze. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I have a little bit darker brown, so I'm actually going to increase the value by adding some darker paint. So I'm being mindful of a slightly darker brown as it goes each shape and a nice clean even flat wash I'm going to dip into this darker brown I'm going to even add a little bit of Payne's gray because I've just about reached dark as dark as it's going to get and I want it to get darker yet. When you have your regular shapes um, it's good to pull out a, an edge and just kind of keep working that edge out. I have just enough water to move the paint but not so much as to create a puddle. Alright, I now have a fairly nice value scale. And if I need to adjust that after it dries, I can do it with, with a very slight glaze. Okay, I wanted to just show you, I've finished this side too, and this is a good example of what the kind of thing that happens. You notice I didn't get the steps in value as accurately over here, and this one turned out splotchy and uneven, and it's because when you start to get into a groove with this stuff and you start painting less mindfully, less concentration basically, uh, these things happen. So that's why it's important to practice very mindfully concentrating on what you're doing. Getting here I've got fairly even steps. Over here not so much. And again if you're not going to paint with this kind of precision it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a form of training intended to uh, allow you to gain control over your medium and then you can lose control in any way in which you see fit but you're losing it by choice you're letting watercolor be expressive by choice and what this does what this benefits you is uh, water pigment ratio control learning water pigment ratio control knowing to how to adjust the water and the pigment in your brush and be able to anticipate what you can put on your paper very very valuable cannot stress how valuable. All right, let's work on some blends. Uh, that's a great thing to practice uh, with shapes like this. By the way, I, this drawing took me about 15 minutes, this transfer. So you can see how quickly and easily you can have something that's not only fun to paint, uh, fun to color, but gives you a great variety of shapes and sizes to practice with. All right, let's do a blend. And I'm gonna blend this area here. I wanna keep it fairly light. So I'm gonna blend from under the bill here out to a very creamy almost white color. I just got a very light red brown and what you want to do in a blend is create this edge, this leading edge. Now I'm going to blot, without taking pigment out, I'm just going to blot, got, blot out some of the water. I've got plenty of water here that I can extend. Now I'm going to blot pigment out of my brush still damp, still plenty damp, 
I'm going to keep this edge nice and wet. you got to work relatively quickly. Blot it again. I got some water, a little more water in there than I wanted to, but there. Now while it's still wet, you don't want to overdo this because it sometimes will look like it. While it's all still damp, you can brush a little bit and even it out. Now I'm going to get some really dark pigment and do some charging. Now, charging is another thing to practice. But again, uh, be mindful of how you do it, how much paint you're using, how much water is in your brush. When you charge, you drastically reduce the water in your brush and greatly increase the pigment. So you got mostly uh, pigment. And charging is just uh, another way of saying wet and wet. I, I think of charging, though, in terms of more precise placement. And wet and wet, I, I tend to think a big splashier. Ooh, let's see, I added water and I got a back run. Yikes. That was not what I wanted. It's because I was not aware of how much water I had in my brush. See how when I added that, it pushed the pigment back up there. Now I have a line. So the best thing to do is to blend that out. Try to soften this line out here. Yeah, so I've got a bit of a line, but... That's why you practice these things. Oh yeah, I, I make these mistakes all the time. I'm going to try charging uh, while it's still wet up in here. Mostly pigment. Just a damp brush. You can see it's not moving much. Now I'm going to blend it like I tried to do before, but uh, with a drier brush. Ah, let's see, now it's perfect. Instead of putting water, I, I didn't follow my own directions. I put more water in my brush, so blends. Practice blends. Use these pieces, these coloring book images to practice blends. So much fun. All right, charging. Let's practice some charging. Charging is dabbing pigment into a wet area. It's a form of wet on wet. Um, it's usually more controlled, as I mentioned before. What you do is you just uh, you paint an area with mostly water, or it could be a light wash or color. But I'm going to paint it with water, and I like to get the the whole shape evenly damp. And I look for that sheen, that even sheen over the whole shape. And I then I uh, dab in pigment, and and the pigment you charge in, you want less less water in your brush, as I mentioned before. It's all about the water in your brush and you just you need to know how to change that in very slight amounts. Just get a real feel for it and how when you when you blot out your brush and blot the moisture out of your brush how you can usually go back and pick up what's there if you've got too much. I'm just gonna get color all the way in this I think and then come back and charge some deeper color. It's a form of a blend, but you're letting the water do the blending for you almost automatically. You just have to set up the circumstances so that they're right. Again, as you're, as you're adding pigment to your wash, you're reducing the water. Big, big, big important point. If you increase water any over what's on here, you're going to end up with a mess. You get just some beautiful subtle shading that way. Get your brush. You can even you can mold these washes a little bit, but you have to make your brush almost dry. And so there's a nicely charged blend. These coloring book images are also a great way to practice glazing. So let me show you a typical example. I mean, there's so many th ways to use glazing. You can use it to change the value. You can use it to change the color. You can use it to shade a flat wash. But here's also a typical uh, use. Now notice how I, on the eye you have these shapes and then sort of these radiating in-between shapes. And I basically painted in each one of these shapes. But another way to do it, and I was going to paint 
well I'll just show you, I was going to paint these in between ones a purple. So those will dry um, where they overlap and unless you paint with a great amount of care and precision you'll get a little bit of a line. So here's how to treat this as a glaze. <clears throat> Watercolor as you may know is a light to dark medium so let's just paint this whole thing purple. As long as you're painting the light color first, you're fine. And as long as you don't mind or you think that that color will mix well with the darker color on top. In this case it should be fine because I, um, I want the colors to be analogous. And the color that's going over that will be quite, quite dark. Okay, I'm going to let that dry. Otherwise, if I paint the dark now, it'll just bleed. Alright, so I'm going to go back up here to the eye now. I'll show you what I'm talking about. I already have that dark color. And it's sort of a violet mixed with Payne's Gray. So the violet mixes really well. And now you just paint in those dark shapes. For this, I could probably, this is a number 8. Although it's a small number 8. Uh, by most number 8 standards. I could probably go to a 4 on shapes this small. Um, when you get into small shapes, you probably do want to reduce your brush size. You still don't want to go too small, but you probably do want to reduce your uh, brush size to keep from uh, using too much water. The bigger the brush, it's good for smooth areas. I mean, you want as big a brush as you can control and get into these areas with your point. But you have the danger of, of putting too much water in those areas. So sort of a trade-off. I still say they'll go with the largest brush that will work and just learn to control the amount of water. Alright, so hopefully you can see that. And yeah, it's a lot cleaner effect. So look for opportunities to do that rather than this. Rather than paint each shape. Put down your lightest color over an area and if the color that's going to go on top will mix well with it, put the darker color over it. Now these bigger shapes, um, irregular shapes, uh, you can do a variety of ways. I like to do a combination of techniques. I'm going to start this pale orange flat wash. So I have a, a pretty big bead of, of water and color here, but since I'm moving that edge out, I'm going to keep it. I'm not going to blot it up because I'll, I'll be able to extend that as we get through the shape. This will be my base wash. It's the lightest wash. I'll just carry that bead around, that edge, until I get the shape filled. And I have a little bit of excess liquid here. Just blot my brush a little bit, pick it up. Until I see the whole thing looks even. And we'll come back to this. Uh, with some other techniques. I'll do the other side. Okay, I have two really nice flat washes there and I'll let those dry. Alright, so these two shapes here are dry and this is a good uh, example of where to use multiple techniques. Um, so I'm going to glaze and shade at the same time. The sh uh, glazing is a good way to shade, uh, especially in larger shapes where you don't want to manage too big of an area at once. So I've got this sort of uh, violet polished brown. I'm going to come in here and paint that where I want to shade it. This is just going to be a simple blend. So um, rinse my brush out. Now I have clear water or mostly clear water in my brush. And I'm just going to blend that glaze out to zero pigment. And I have a nice little shadow glazed right over that color. Now you can further uh, combine techniques by charging. But this little bl blend here is still wet. By the way, don't be afraid to turn your piece if there are difficult hand positions. Um, sometimes that's uh, a good thing to do. So I'm charging now wet and wet, just charging and deepening that shadow right along the edge of the bill. 
You can do the same thing. Maybe in this curly cue, maybe I want that to be darker. So add a little bit of a, a wash there, some pigment. Blot out my brush, maybe rinse it a little. Blend it out till it blends. Now I have this color glazed over and shading that color. Exercise as much control as you can because then you'll know how whether you end up using it or not. Alright and one last thing I want to talk about is scaling up for a large area. So you want to pick a bigger brush. I've picked one that has a really nice fine point uh, and I'm going to fill this big area here but that's something you don't want to do with too small a brush. You want to be able to get into these crevices so you need a point but um, you need enough body in the brush to hold the paint that you're going to require to fill that space. And this will probably be two or three different glazes. I'm going to start with a light reddish brown wash. Thankfully I've got, uh, that's putting down a little too much water. Thankfully I've got a nice point on this one. That's going to be your one drawback to a bigger brush is all that moisture that it puts down. But by the same token, it's, it's pretty important to helping you get an uh, even wash in a bigger area. But you want to keep that wet edge moving. Because back here it's probably drying out. You've got to paint around these small obstacles quickly. Making sure that edge stays wet. Oops, a little too fast. Getting sloppy there. I don't try on bigger areas like this, I don't try to do any shading. I mainly just try to keep my wash flat and even. But we're going to do some careful shading on this, which I probably will. Then I like to start with a flat wash because then instead of managing blends everywhere, that's difficult in a large shape. Okay, and I've got, I'm ending up up here, just kind of pulling that wet edge around. And by the time that dries, I'll have a nice, even, flat wash. And then I can go back in and do some blends here, blends here, blends here. While those blends are wet, I can charge and just combine techniques as before. It's already dry up here, so I'm going to do a little bit of a blend. And you can do these gradually. These can be several layers. And if you want, if you're just blending a small area, you can scale down to a smaller brush, of course. Alright, well you can see I've made a good bit of progress on this. Just doing more of the same things that uh, I have been telling you about. And I'm just going to go ahead and let you watch as I finish this up. So it should probably go without saying, but I guess I better say it in case some of you haven't thought of it. This is a great way to try out new paint, new colors, new paper, new brushes. Just a fun way to compare colors, paper, and brushes. So if you're not really into practicing these techniques at the moment, but maybe you've got a few uh, nice new colors or maybe you've got a new pad of paper you just want to uh, give that a try 
great way to do it with coloring book images. And as I mentioned before, uh, you can trace or transfer like three or four of these uh, or a half a dozen of these maybe in an afternoon and have them on standby waiting for you for whatever occasions come up. An image, maybe just do a little piece of an image uh, to warm up before doing your actual painting. This gives you a complex, interesting subject without a lot of work. Yeah, I think I'm pretty much done with this. But there's one final technique that I forgot to mention that you can practice, and that is lining. Um, a lot of these edges can be cleaned up, since I didn't use an ink line, can be cleaned up uh, with a paint line. And just go in and paint linear detail. Clean up lines, shadow lines. I'm using a number four. Again, a Skoda Prado. All, a lot of, everything I've used today has been in a Skoda Prado. New brush I've been uh, trying out and absolutely love. And it's just something uh, to practice. And getting your paint consistency is usually a big deal when you're doing lining. You don't want it watery, but you want it uh, thin enough that it flows off the brush well. It's a good way to practice brush control. Tip pressure. All of that stuff. All right. Thanks, Minders. I really appreciate you tuning in, and I hope this gave you some exciting new ideas and ways to practice. I spent an enjoyable afternoon doing this. Zero pressure in terms of coming up with a drawing or painting that I could paint. It's just shapes to fill, basically. And by the time you finish something like this, you will have noticed your confidence factor uh, going up. Ability to quickly decide on how to do a technique, to apply the technique, getting your paint water ratio right. Can't stress it enough. Great, great practice. Great idea for warm-ups, aside from all the fun that you'll have doing it. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you patrons for sponsoring this channel. You're making all this happen, and I will see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.